Hi there. So thanks very much for inviting me to speak to you. I'm Lucy Saggers and I'm a documentary photographer. I'd like to give you a brief background of myself, an uh, overview of my practice and to show you some pictures from a couple of my longer term projects. So a quick background just to say that I didn't become a photographer in anything close to a straightforward route. Um, although having had a camera of some sort for most of my life, I, um, I always recognised that I love taking pictures um, and realise now that photography is for me a way of holding on to something that I really value and treasure. I came across this book um, as a as a nine year old, and um, that's when I first strangely thought about becoming a photographer. So much prior to um, you guys, um, I so James Revilius documented rural life in North Devon in the nineteen seventies, and um, I was very struck by this work um, at a young age, and remember looking through it in um, in awe, um, and thinking at that time this work is amazing and that's what I would love to do um, but at the same time writing it off as a as a bit of an impossibility because I felt like everyone wanted to be a photographer and so few people could actually um, could actually achieve it. I did learn darkroom photography in my teens and, and loved that um, but whenever I debated studying photography um, I was advised by parents to do the science now, you can do the art later. And I now believe that you can listen to all the advice you're given, but you don't necessarily have to follow it. And, and that's a lesson that I, I still adhere to. Um, so yeah, listen to people's advice, but only take their advice if it, if it resonates. I did the science, I got two science degrees and spent 10 years working in wildlife conservation in Africa and the UK. And then I found myself many years later, uh, married with three small children and living here in North Yorkshire. Um, I, I finally couldn't resist the camera, the call of the camera any longer and um, began my, uh, to, ful to fulfill that what I'd identified all those years before as, as this desire to, um, to document rural life. I had to abandon my film camera at that uh, because, because having lived with me in the um, humid rainforest, it had filled with mould, um, which I discovered from the brilliant camera shop in York was um, impossible to remove. So it was 2012 when I first um, bought a digital SLR and uh, started to take pictures again. Um, I knew right from the outset that I wanted to do that documenting of rural life that I'd shown you the James Revilius book about. Um, I wanted to document the ordinary and the everyday because I think it's those things that are what define us, um, the connections between people and the connections between people and their landscape um, is particularly of interest to me. Um, so it's the impressions that we leave on the land and also that the landscape, our landscape leaves on us. Um, and that sense of rootedness to a place of belonging to a community um, that I really felt for the first time when I had lived in Ampleforth village um, here in North Yorkshire for, for a number of years. It's something that I'd identified as being important in, in life, um, that, that sense of belonging and, and community. But I really felt like I started to belong to a community um, living in, in, in North Yorkshire. But as you can see, I'm showing you pictures of landscapes because to start with, I didn't dare to photograph people. I, I didn't dare approach them. Um, and so I felt like I needed to hone my skills to practice and become confident in what I was doing. 
and to do that um, I, I basically I used the landscape because it wasn't going to ask me any questions it wasn't going to expect any results um, so it felt like a safe place to practice and also a huge love of mine and a huge passion um, so not a not a bad thing to be doing um, I love all different types of landscape. Um, I love the form and, and pattern that you find in, in the landscape um, and details. This is hoar frosted ivy. Um, that last one uh, there is a potato field. Um, and the small details as well, some horse hair on, on, on a barbed wire fence. And so after a time of, um, of making these pictures, I dared to ask um, a farmer friend that I knew from the school gate actually um, if I could shadow him for a morning and um, this is the best picture that I got I didn't he didn't want to be photographed and um, and and I have to have um, a comfortable relationship with <clears throat> with the person I'm photographing if they don't want to be then 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 so be it um, so that was a that was a a, a big step for me but a complete fail but it was a really important part of the process and and it 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 you know I got there in the end um I eventually took myself down to this farm in the village and um dared to ask them if I could photograph just whatever was going on people working um and this guy Mark was great amazing to photograph because he just carried on as if the camera wasn't there and that's my absolute ideal and I knew that this particular place would work for me um, in terms of it being a place of rural um, working life that felt like it was stitched into the landscape over generations these rambling character filled buildings and um, old tools and places and objects that were rich in uh, in in their stories of life nothing too tidy or ordered um, sort of strings of buildings that have evolved over the years and so they tell their own story and and stories is really what I would like my photography to be about and also I feel it's important to photograph these places and things before they are tidied out of existence And I didn't plan initially to just photograph one village. I imagined that I would work over a wider and wider area. But um, one day I was driving out of the village specifically to go and photograph further afield. And I recognized as a physical feeling of being drawn back to the village um, and, and realizing at that point that actually what I wanted to do was to dig deeper in in this one place that the more I'd found out about this community the the more I wanted to find out and to explore those connections and interconnections between people and between people and their landscape and so my practice involves walking with my camera and encountering people and places and goings on and seeking out um, I don't um, photograph people without permission. I, I, I take a very slow approach um, because I really want people to feel comfortable with my presence, to be at their most natural, um, and I want them to be happy with the results and I won't use a picture uh, unless, unless they are. Even if I ask permission afterwards, I, you know, I could take a picture uh, without somebody knowing, uh, but then I would always ask them, afterwards if, if they were okay with it. In terms of the equipment that I use it's really very simple. Um, initially I had a Canon SLR um, and I almost always used it with a 50 millimeter lens. In the last couple of years I've moved to a Sony um, with a 40 mil lens. Uh, manual focus which I absolutely love and I can't now imagine going back to um, autofocus. I want my equipment to be small um, to be unobtrusive. Um, I like a wide fast lens. I don't use flash, I just use natural available light. 
um, I don't use a tripod because I find they are, they make me very static. So I like to move, I, move, I, I don't like a telephoto lens because I, I want to be doing the moving. Um, this is um, Betty with her, she's my next door neighbor. And so I'm very much an opportunistic photographer. I, I encounter um, my pictures. So I have my camera with me. This is on my way home from walking my dogs. Um, I encounter my photographs. I'm not the kind of person who can wait for something to um, to arrive. I, uh, it, you know, it may be a mistake, it may be impatient, but that's that's how it works for me. Um, and this is an example that I wanted to show you to illustrate that point. So I'd actually gone to Betty's house to collect a parcel that she had taken delivery of for me. She was baking and I asked her if I could take a picture of this, which seemed to me a beautiful still life. And then she leant in and to adjust something and kind of gave me, gifted me this photograph, which was my first photograph um, of Betty. And um, to be honest, I could photograph practically everything that Betty does. It's, um, I just, I just um, am captivated by, by her. This is called Coconut Slice and she just offered Penelope on the right a slice of this cake and Penelope was literally saying, oh my favourite. And Herbert, you know, her husband in the background with his empty teacup dangling and looking a bit sort of like he's probably had enough of the situation. Um, I've got some still life pictures which are of objects that I've encountered through um, my exploration of, with this project that I feel sort of add to the stories. Black and white is my first love and I decided that this whole project, I wanted it to be in black and white. Um, I love the way black and white um, concentrates on composition, on light and on texture. And also I think it perhaps focuses us on the timelessness of, of, um, of the themes. I can still be nervous about asking people to, um, for me to photograph them, um, but I am a great believer that the right moment will uh, uh, make itself apparent. Um, and sometimes you have to be patient, but when you feel like there's a chink and, and that that moment is right, then you definitely have to seize that moment. Um, and this was one of those moments where I knew Betty um, had the same person who uh, cut her hair every, or did her hair for her every couple of weeks. Um, and I waited for a long time for the right moment to ask her and if I could photograph that and and um, and it appeared and by this point Betty's so comfortable with me and my camera that she just said of course you can if you want to and Betty was widowed by this time and at this as I took this photograph I asked Lynn the hairdresser how long she'd been cutting Betty's hair because it became very clear to me that there was an incredible relationship between Lynn and Betty that 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 was very valuable and, and important and she said oh um well that'll be since 1976 so since Lynn was 15 years old and the love uh and connection between them was something that I just found rather magical I've got a couple of portraits here that I wanted to show you. This is Mr. Byrne, the coal man, great name. A farrier local, local to us up on Sutton Bank. Albert setting mole traps. And then here's Albert's fence, which I just love the fact that he's beautifully threaded the baler twine to, uh, to save the fence for a bit longer. Joyce and her daughter-in-law lambing. It took me a while to persuade Joyce to let me use photographs of her. But it's a tenderness that, that, that I, uh, I love in her work. 
farmer. So there are lots of stories. Um, I'm zipping through these, I know, but I love this for the fact that it's three generations of, of female farmers in the village. And these just totally everyday encounters, which we're all missing more than ever through this pandemic. This is EU referendum day, quite poignant, ongoing in an ongoing way. And that's a quick view of my Ampleforth project. Um, and, and I want to say about it that I believe these kinds of stories and connections exist everywhere. Um, it's, it's something that we can see uh, if, we, if we sort of open our eyes to them. I was lucky to get funding from Rydell District Council a couple of years ago to produce a small book to go with an exhibition at the Rydell Folk Museum. Um, I've still got about 20 copies of that book left. Um, and then just to quickly whiz through a few pictures from a project I'm working on at the moment, which I encountered um, at, this is at the Star um, in Harem, and it's a father and daughter thatching. So uh, William has been thatching for a long time and he's teaching his daughter Phoebe to thatch. And it's an ancient craft that I didn't know much about. And as, as with my other project, I, as I find more out, I, I, I just want to dig deeper and deeper. And um, so this is straw thatching. Um, basically thatching is done with the, uh, the, the nearest sort of material that's to hand. So this I discovered is what they use in, um, in County Durham very occasionally now is heather. And the, look how steep that roof is. So there's Phoebe with a bundle of heather and I've lifted one of those, they're heavy. And then this is up in um, Northumberland where they're again thatching with heather. And this was November last year. And at that point I got the idea that what I really wanted to do then was to, to follow the story of the materials and how, where they come from and how they're grown. So actually just last Saturday, I had to wait a whole year. Last Saturday, I went and photographed that um, heather being harvested. So this is Phoebe again going up on the roof with a wet, heavy bale of heather. Uh, this is a house in Farndale. The, the bright white um, roof is thatched here in reed, which is not traditional for this area, but some people prefer it. And then here, this is, these are from last Saturday, the heather on the, with zero, almost zero visibility up on the moor in Northumberland. So thank you very much for listening and um, get in touch if you would like to know any more. <laughs>